Well, I'm uh, actually pleased and proud that uh, we've come to this agreement here in Frankfurt today. The um, governors and head of supervision, otherwise called GHOS, uh, met and uh, endorsed the outstanding Basel III post-crisis regulatory reforms called also Basel III end game. The focus of the reforms agreed today in a very general way is uh, to reduce regulatory uncertainty. Uh, one of, the, one of the, the things that have been said during our meeting is that now uh, the regulatory environment uh, would become a much more certain <laughs> Than, uh, than it was before, and now it's time of implementation, not, uh, not further design. More specifically, uh, the uh, goal of today's meeting was to reduce the risk-weighted uh, capital framework variability to have uh, measures that would lead to a reduction and basically restore the credibility of the risk-weighted assets. Uh, specifically, the reforms agreed today by the GEOS include the following. A revised standardized approach for credit risk, revisions to the internal ratings-based approach for credit risk, revisions to the credit valuation adjustment framework, a revised standardized approach for operational risk, revisions to the leverage ratio framework, including a leverage ratio buffer for globally systemic, global systemically important banks, and an aggregate output floor, which will ensure that banks' risk-weighted assets generated by internal models are no lower than 72.5% of risk-weighted assets as calculated by the standardized approaches. So this, uh, this endorsement by the GEOS of the Basel III reforms is a, a major milestone. And uh, this will, as I said, reduce excessive variability of risk-weighted assets without significantly increasing capital requirements in, in the aggregate, of course. The, still much work to do, however, because uh, this global agreement has to be now transposed into national law and regulations and for this reason, the GHOS agreed about a starting date in 2022. So we also agreed to phase in the output floor over a period of five years. The five-year phase in is also available at supervisory discretion. Now, it's also important to note that all GHOS members confirmed their expectation to implement the reforms agreed today in a timely and consistent manner. Uh, we also have um, a, a, a paper, a dis there was also a discussion, brief discussion about a paper on regulatory treatment of sovereign exposures where basically uh, what was decided is uh, that no measures would be uh, taken, no decisions would be taken and the Basel Committee would publish, so not, not, uh, not the GEOS, the Basel Committee would publish this paper as a technical contribution. Um, the, so the key policy lever is the output floor that basically limits the capital benefits that banks can, uh, can obtain from the use of internal models and this behavior in the past led uh, to uh, imprudently low levels of capital. Now it's 72.5%. We should understand that this is a compromise. There were members who wanted a higher level, members who wanted a lower level. And uh, it's also a minimum standard like um, most of the agreements uh, uh, taken by, uh, d designed by the Basel Committee. Um, so, as I said, the GEOS uh, members have announced their expectation that they would uh, implement all the elements of the package. Let me also add that it's not only the output floor, but also the market risk review of the trading book, where the calendar and the calibration 
was, uh, were, were discussed and decided. Now, let me say that this agreement is, in a sense, the ultimate stage of an effort that has seen, uh, first and foremost, the work of the Basel Committee under the chair of uh, Stefan Ingves. And let me also thank the secretary of the GEOS, Bill Cohen, but also let me thank all the GEOS members because uh, it's been a long-waited, long -waited, but also not an easy uh, compromise, and therefore the GEOS members were, uh, are to be praised for their willingness to reach this result today. And uh, here I am, uh, we are now at your disposal for questions. Please. Uh, this come from Bloomberg News. Um, I um, have to wonder whether uh, the, the, the biggest banks, the world's biggest banks, are certainly happier with what uh, with what is being compromised now rather than maybe what was being discussed 18 months ago. Um, in the interest of reaching a compromise, did you water down your proposals too far, Mr. Engvers? And are we? I mean, should we not have seen a higher floor? Um, and does this, does a 72.5% floor really protect us from the next crisis would be my, my first question. And my second question was, you, you say you have a deal, but the, the fundamental review of the trading book is, is not completed yet. I know that's something that Bill Cohen's probably will be, a, be, a, be addressing. Um, how sure are we, even if everyone's committed to, to implementing what comes out, how sure are we that the deal won't actually unravel in a couple of months' time when people see the results of... The, the, the study on, on the FRTB and say, actually, that is more punitive than we imagined. Or maybe I'm misinformed. Thank you. Stefan, why don't you Well, on, 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 on the first issue of the level of the floor, one has, has to be mindful of the fact that this is a negotiation. And when, when uh, you negotiate, uh, some people want to have a higher floor, and others uh, would have preferred a lower floor. And the nature of the negotiation always is such that when you bring something to a conclusion, then uh, 72 and a half is a good number. It's a very good number. Uh, then when it comes to the issue of the FRTB, if I use the short form, the trading book, uh, part of it was that during the work on the FRTB, and particularly when, uh, when the committee and many committee members moved into thinking about the implementation, it was set for uh, 2019, but it became clear both on the supervisory side and on the side of the banks that it would be difficult uh, to actually get the work done by that date. And by moving the date to 2022, it's coordinated uh, with all the other things that are in included in this, uh, in this package because uh, there was a consensus that we needed a bit more time uh, to do the, uh, do, do the technical work. And by doing it in this way, we still have a well-coordinated package, uh, while at the same time we can spend the time that is needed to do the technical work. Thank you. CNBC. Um, Looking at the risks now in the financial system outstanding, how can you be so confident in saying we're done now? Um, I'm a bit surprised. I'm rather looking at the debt level in, in various co uh, jurisdictions. <clears throat> Haven't you sort of in your mind perhaps regulation which would go even further? Um, that's my question. Sorry, uh, we are not done. I mean, I wouldn't want misunderstood. We are not done in the sense that uh, lots of work has to be done in implementing the measures that have been just been agreed. What is done is to uh, continue designing new rules. At this point in time, the key the key uh, action is to put in practice what's been agreed, and uh, it's unquestionable that this measure will reduce the excessive and unwanted and often unwarranted variability in risk-weighted assets. That's the key point of this, uh, of this measure. Of course, you also have the review of the trading book and so on, but uh, it's not that it's finished. Actually, it maybe uh, the, the difficult part starts now. Or, well, I wouldn't want to 
the difficult part was difficult to reach this agreement. It's equally difficult now that all the jurisdictions would put in place and implement the agreement in a timely and consistent manner as they have pronounced today, as they've said today. Stefan. No, just let me add that uh, the process that has come to an end today is the technical part negotiating the framework. And that, has, uh, that takes time because uh, just takes time when you do this type of technical work and uh, takes a bit of extra time sometimes to get to an agreement. But exactly as Mario says, once that is done and the so-called rules text is being published as we speak, then it will take uh, a bit more time than for uh, many, many jurisdictions all over the world to actually implement this. And on top of that, which additionally will take time in the future, uh, for the Basel Committee uh, to follow up and track that the implementation also actually happens. So in, in that sense, one can say that uh, it's a kind of a perennial process. Gentleman back there. Hi, Bernd Neubach, I'm with Börsenzeitung. I'm wondering, um, why is it impossible to agree on uh, um, risk ratings for government um, exposures? sovereign exposures? Because there were um, many members, if not most members, who didn't want to have that. And some wanted. Stefan, do you want to elaborate? No, just let, no, just let, me, add, let, let me add to that, that the, the Basel Committee, and ultimately, of course, uh, the GHAS group works on b the basis of consensus. And at this juncture, it was not possible to get to a consensus on this particular issue. And then the default is to continue uh, the way the rules are today. Gentlemen in the front, please. Uh, thanks very much from MLEX, John Riga. Uh, about the, the sovereign exposures, is your group committing to having a pillar one standard on that at some point? And then I just have to ask about the, uh, the idea of no uh, increase in capital standards in the aggregate. You've heard a lot about uh, you know, the impact feared by the European banks. What is your understanding now about how much of an impact there will be for them? Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Stefan, why don't you, then I can address something about the QIS impact of, but, but please go ahead. Well, first, at this stage, uh, there was no consensus on how to deal with sovereign risk, and that means that the present framework stays. What happens in the future, whenever that may be, I cannot say, because this is uh, what the consensus that we reached as of now, to uh, have the technicians publish a highly technical paper uh, for comments uh, by those who wish to comment on that paper. Uh, but the paper is not backed by a consensus, and that's also very clearly stated, and that means that uh, until things change, whenever that might be, uh, things uh, stay uh, the, way they, uh, the way they are. And uh, on the QIS uh, and in the document that we publish today, we uh, publish uh, the QIS in the aggregate, and there you see very small changes. But then, of course, banks uh, are different in different parts of the world, so that does not mean that it, it is exactly the same for each and every bank uh, all, uh, all, over the, uh, all over the world. But having said that, it's also important to keep in mind that the QIS that we publish is based on uh, 2015 data. And in the meantime, uh, many, many banks have uh, made uh, quite reasonable profits. And we also here talk about a fairly long gradual adjustment period. So in our judgment, uh, all banks uh, can actually adjust to uh, what we have uh, decided today. And, and let me also add that it's, it's foreseen that there will be other QIS between now and 2022, very likely. So it will be, a, I wouldn't say continuous assessment of the impact of these measures on on capital, but uh, but fairly fairly frequent. Claire Jones, Financial Times. Um, two questions, if I may. Um, if we add in the phase-in period, we're looking at a set of rules that are going to come 
into force 20 years after the start of the financial crisis. Um, I'd like to know your general thoughts on, is that too long a period for a new set of rules to come into place? And if so, is there anything about the processes under which you've all worked that you think could be improved or at least looked at by future generations of, of supervisors? And for my, for my second question, you've mentioned that these rules need to be implemented in national law. Is there any possibility, do you think, that some jurisdictions could delay their introduction past 2022? Or speaking to people in the room, are you pretty confident that all of the major nations involved will have these rules in their national laws by 2022? Thank you. Well, first of all, whether it took too long or not, we can argue about that. This is the time it took to get to a global uh, agreement. And with many, uh, many people around the table, a lot of technical work to be done. That's just the nature of this uh, business. But having said that, I also, I think we should be mindful of the fact that the Basel Committee has been around since the mid, I think it's 1970s. So in that sense, uh, this is work that has been going on among supervisors for a long, long time. And that is, I think, very, very important than individual time uh, frame, frames for this and, th this and that, because that creates an environment where supervisors from all over the world constantly talk to each other, and that makes it a lot easier to find a consensus eventually compared to if uh, these types of cooperative uh, processes uh, did not, uh, did not uh, exist uh, at all. So it takes a bit of time, but so far so good. And when it comes to implementation, everybody has signed up to this, uh, and that is clear from the meeting that we held uh, today as well. Oh, let, me, let me add that uh, it's not that since the crisis to today, nothing has been done. Um, it, as a matter of fact, the first response to the crisis came out in April 2000, uh, 2008, and it was a list of more than 70 recommendations by what was called then the Financial Stability Forum, which then later became the Financial Stability Board. And much of the time has been taken actually to implement and better design these recommendations. So, um, so much so that today the capital requirement, the liquidity, the leverage ratios, I would say all parts of a bank's balance sheets today represents a, a resilience that was certainly not in place before the crisis. Yes, please. Francesco Canepa, Reuters. <clears throat> the world has moved on in the past, um, well, decade, while these rules were in the making, and fintech has emerged, and, and shadow banking has, has ballooned. So who is the supervisor of last resort if, if trouble happens in, in these two sectors? Stefan, Bill? Well, I mean, the Basel Committee deals with banking, but fintech is also certainly part of, of what is happening in the financial sector and what banks are and will be focusing on and are very mindful of. Uh, there are many different global initiatives dealing with various aspects of fintech, uh, but part of it is also the supervisory part and the supervisory part of fintech within the banking sector itself. Uh, that is what the Basel Committee is, is, is dealing with. But uh, then there's a whole, whole group of other international organizations working on other aspects of, of, of fintech. So in, in that sense, one could argue that it's a fairly broad, uh, broad project that is ongoing presently, pretty also under the auspices of the Financial Stability Board. And uh, under that umbrella, uh, the Basel Committee is doing its part, but that's mostly confined to banking. Well, shadow banking is, I mean, that's another issue which uh, the Basel Committee has dealt with in the past from the perspective of what kind of risk weights would you have when you lend to non-banks in the financial sector? 
that's the sort of from a definitional point of view how the Basel Committee comes comes into into this. But still, it's important to keep in mind that the Basel Committee is dealing with banks and bank supervision, and then there are many many other phenomena, so to speak, in the financial sector, and those are nowadays in one form or the other uh, covered by a fairly large group of uh, various international bodies uh, that, that do their bits and pieces in this, and then all of it is done and coordinated by the Financial Stability Board. There is a general awareness, just to respond to the last two questions, however, that there is a general awareness that uh, uh, that uh, much of what's been done in the in the in the uh, realm of regulation uh, has affected the regulated entities, i.e., banks mostly, and uh, it's, it's, I would say that everybody would agree that now it's high time to extend some of this regulation to the shadow banking sector as well. And uh, and as Stefan said, the FSB, the Financial Stability Board, is. Uh, is, uh, is actively working on, on this project. Hello, I have a quick follow-up. I mean, and I, I simply can't ignore, I, mean, I haven't had time to go through the documents, um, but a headline I see is that the CET1 ratio for large banks actually rises by 20 basis points. And if I, my very initial assessment is correct, it's, I mean, the, the, the shortfall is really only based on a couple of outliers, so, Again, I mean, does this go far enough in, in, in controlling risk if banks actually come out with a, at least in the aggregate, a, a, a higher CT1 ratio? Well, that, that is for the, that, that's for the system as in, in the aggregate, but then one should also be mindful of how this has been put together because we are also dealing with outliers and excess risk weight variability. So there are very different uh, breaks, if I call it that, in the system today compared to, let's say, 10 years ago or 15 years ago. So uh, there are many more constraints uh, today uh, than before the financial crisis. And there is good reason for that because uh, outliers, uh, in some instances, uh, became a problem. And that created the need to embark on this ex extensive program that we have worked our way through in the past, past number of years to ensure that when you take, when you look at the various assets and liabilities for that matter, if you get into the NSFR and the LCR, that you look at them carefully in such a way that you deal with the outliers so that uh, the system does not kind of run amok by itself. And that means that uh, the system as a whole today is much more, if I call it, boxed in than it was 10, 15 years ago. Let me just, uh, I'll give for to, to Bill in a moment, but let me add that the focus of the exercise was not to increase capital. As a matter of fact, the GEOS almost a year ago endorsed this review by the Basel Committee, provided it wouldn't create a significant capital increase in the aggregate of the banking system. So you have outliers, of course, for them, capital needs are going to go up. Uh, but in the aggregate, that was the understanding. The, uh, the main focus was on reducing the unwarranted variability in risk weights. In other words, uh, um, avoid those situations which uh, had uh, happened during the crisis and after the crisis by some of these outliers who uh, basically used their internal models to produce uh, weights uh, that would uh, reduce their capital needs in, uh, in, a, in a fashion that was considered imprudent. And so it, uh, it, the main focus of this part, uh, it's a package. So let's not forget about the other parts, but the focus of this part was to uh, rebuild the credibility of, uh, of the capital system, not necessarily to increase capital, because as I said a moment ago, capital has gone up a lot in, in the last uh, 10 years. Bill. Just to, uh, <clears throat> yeah, I just wanted to emphasize that point. <clears throat> if, the, if the objective of the exercise was to raise capital, it would have been a lot easier just to raise capital requirements, uh, the minimum capital requirements, and was to reduce variability, and was uh, mainly to, to catch the outliers. The, the other point, um, the data you're looking at, um, 
you're looking at the, the target level, the, the minimum level. Um, as we know, in many jurisdictions around the world, banks are held to a higher standard through uh, the supervisory process. Um, and certainly, the market um, will require more. The market expectations are higher than what uh, the minimum requirements that are set out in, uh, in the Basel framework. Please. Hello, Fiona Maxwell from Politico. A question for all of you. Do you think banks are now crisis-proof? I'm sorry, do you think what? A bank's crisis-proof. I think uh, uh, the answer to this is that, uh, at least my answer to that, is that uh, nothing is crisis-proof. Uh, what, uh, what we should aim at is to increase the resilience of the system that we supervise, and, um, and that's, that is the main aim. But uh, where the next crisis will come from, we, we certainly can't foresee. But uh, now we, are, we, we can clearly see that the present system is much more resilient than the one we used to be having before the crisis. Stefan? No, I, I, agree, I agree with that. The system will be stronger compared to the system that we had. Well, on the other hand, it's hard to foresee what will happen in the future. Yeah. So uh, and, and that, that holds for many, many phenomena that we deal with in, in, in society. So my belief is that we're in better shape and will be in better shape once this is implemented. Uh, but at the same time, it's impossible to know what the future has in store. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. We can see each other next week. Huh? <laughs> Let me shake hands one more. Thank you, Seth.